from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Robin Reed announces that the new Kansas Land Values book from K-State is now out. Based on actual land sales data, this annual report is a thorough portrayal of Kansas farm and ranch land value trends. She'll go over the land sales volumes and average prices paid for agricultural ground in 2021. Then we'll meet the newly named state director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas, Dennis McKinney. He'll talk about the priorities he'll be pursuing in implementing USDA programs as he takes the reins of the FSA in this state. And awaiting with another Stop, Look, and Listen K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. All that here on Agriculture Today. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. Thanks for being along with us once again. What we'll cover in our opening segment is of recurring importance to just about anybody involved in agriculture. Kansas State University and its partner in this project, the Kansas Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers, has just come out with the Kansas Agricultural Land Values and Trends Report for 2021. And on K-State's part, our guest now contributes greatly to this effort. Robin Reed is an agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension. This has become a valued commodity, if you will, in terms of information, Robin. What, in its fourth year now? Yeah, so we started doing this project right around four years ago in conjunction with the Kansas Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. And, you know, obviously everybody wants to know what's going on with the land markets in our state And a unique opportunity we have is to look at the sales that occurred through the Kansas Property Valuation Department, um, summarize those even down to the county level for irrigated, non-irrigated, and pasture hay ground, and report some numbers just to show the average, the min and the max values that our agricultural land is selling for here in Kansas. This is a great profile of just what's happening in that market. In recent years, we we have seen, well, certainly the last couple, uh, considerable appreciation in those values, haven't we? Yeah, so we were kind of on a holding pattern um, for quite a few years as we had the downturn in the farm economy. You know, there was a lot of fear going into that that we could see a fall in land values equivalent back to the 1980s where we did have a big run up in land values and then obviously quite a significant crash after that and that really didn't happen really starting at the end of 2020 as we saw commodity prices going up we saw the land market really start on fire i guess is a good way to put it And throughout 2021, we just saw a run-up in land values that we haven't seen probably ever in the history of Kansas that we've been tracking land values. So most everybody knows this, but the market is very hot right now for ag land, and there's a lot of it selling right now. Mm -hmm. So this book, um, we've pushed it out a little earlier than we have in past years just because a lot of producers and different people are very interested in what the land market's doing right now. Briefly here, Robin, although there are all sorts of influences on land values, most assuredly locally, what were some of the prime, as you put them, drivers of these value trends? Well, obviously what we've seen is a lot of increase in farm income. Um, We had the pandemic that put about a lot of government payments, CFAT payments into the farm economy. We've had commodity prices coming up, obviously creating a lot more cash on our farms than we've had in the past and creating some opportunities to bid on this land. And you couple that with low interest rates. Uh, I was just talking to a producer today and discussing this. We know that interest rates are going to be going up. So there's a lot, like right now, a lot of incentive to get a land purchase made and lock in an interest rate on it. So I don't see the land market cooling off. Um, A lot of times what we're seeing too is that non-ag investment in this farm ground. And I think that is going to enter the conversation more and more as we go forward. Um, How much is that affecting our Kansas ag land values? We know it is, but it's hard to quantify how much. Let's talk numbers from the report. And just the general number on how much land values have arisen in Kansas from 2020 to 
and through 2021. Well, I'd like to start with just looking at the volume of ag sales in Kansas. And I first want to define what is an ag sale. Mm. I don't look at anything less than 70 acres. So to me, if the parcel's less than 70 acres, it's probably got a lot of non-ag influence in that sale. So I first start with those parcels. But as I said, last year in 2020, the fourth quarter, we saw a lot of ground starting to come on the market. And then in 2021, so last year, we had 568,000 acres that sold here in the state of Kansas for ag land. So, you know, again, just a lot of acres on the market. And what's interesting to see, too, is where that land is selling from. So we divide in the book, we divide into the crop reporting districts. So there's nine crop reporting districts. Um, Those follow the USDA National Ag Statistic crop reporting districts. And what we typically see every year is the Southwest having the largest amount of sales by volume. They're typically close to 100,000 of the total, you know, I said 500,000 acres. Mm -hmm. And then the other regions that had a lot of sales this year were West Central and South Central. So those were 80, 90,000 acres that sold. The interesting thing is the highest prices by far are in our northeast region. You know, we see Atchison County, Donovan Brown, you know, some of the really high 10,000 acre plus sales. But that region makes up a very small portion of the ag land sold across Kansas. So in a typical year, that tends to be 20,000 acres or so. And, you know, so what this boils down to is the areas that have the highest values are typically the lowest volume of sales that we see. And that held true this year, too, even with a lot more land on the market. So that's a look at the acreage actually moving this past year. But the value side of it now, and we can talk about dry land, we can talk about irrigated land and and grassland likewise. Breaking that out, what did you find, Robin? Well... Really, non-irrigated crop ground, obviously, is the largest volume of land that's sold in the state of Kansas. And at the state level, I had that value at $2,032 last year. And this year, that increased to $2,248. So I track it in the book as a change over the previous five-year average. So that's about a 10.5% change over the previous five-year average. It's also about a 10% change over... 2020 or the previous year. And, you know, as you look at it regionally, there's a lot of regions of Kansas that are up 20% instead of 10%. And locally, probably more than that. But overall, the state number um, is about 10%. And as, like I said, a lot of that is driven on our areas with the largest volume of sales being our lower priced areas. So, A lot of people look at that state number and say, oh, that's pretty low. Well, that is a state average. And again, a lot of the non-irrigated crop ground is selling in our districts that have lower prices. How about irrigated ground then? Pretty substantial increase percentage-wise, you say? Yeah. So irrigated, you know, is really increasing at a faster rate than any of our other categories. Last year, 2020, I had the state average at 3,247. Um, That's now jumped up to right over 3,800 on average per acre for irrigated crop ground. And that's from the five-year average up about 23% from our previous five-year average and really up about 17, 18% from last year. So Mm -hmm. quite a significant jump. But it it does vary by location in the state. Um, Just an example, southwest irrigated ground I have up. 45% over the previous year. So there's a lot of local land market components to this as well that makes it hard. It kind of blends in at the state level, but these local land markets can be swinging quite widely from what that state level number is. You do have grassland value numbers likewise. Yep. So I combine pasture land and hay ground into one category And that as well, obviously, is up. I had it 
last year about uh, 1,900. It's up over 2,000 now, so about 11% change over the five-year average, um, about 8 or 9% since last year. And really that is driven a lot by our southeast and our, our east-central areas, being the Flint Hills areas, driving that average um, as most of the grassland is sold in those two crop reporting districts. But how these values break out regionally and even to the county level, and those local values can be sought out in this report, right? Absolutely. And obviously, those county numbers are what everybody's looking at. And I look at every sale in every county, and even accounting for those extreme outliers, there's just a lot of variation, even within a county, of what land is going for. Just to kind of pick a county across the state. I see anywhere from six to eight hundred dollars per acre on the low end, up to three to four thousand on the top end, and that's just a mix between grass and non-irrigated crop ground. So there's a lot of dynamics going into what a piece of ground is worth, and I like to tell people it is worth what two parties are willing to spend on it and competing with each other for that piece of ground. So that's why at the county level I report the average. But then I also report the min and the max just to give people an idea of the variation that occurs in per acre value of a land sale. And all that is put together clearly for producers to study. The report is now out on agmanager.info for review. Yes. So you can find it at agmanager.info. We are going to have hard printed copies of this book, hopefully out in a couple weeks and out to our county extension offices for people to pick up. But again, if you'd rather get a glance at the numbers right now, agmanager.info, it's very clearly titled there on that front page, Kansas Land Values Book. Click on that link. It'll take you right to the data. Great work as always on this, Robin, and thanks for this report. Thank you, Eric. Robin Reed, agricultural economist, K-State Research and Extension, on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Welcome back. It's our pleasure on this part of the broadcast to introduce to you the newly appointed State Executive Director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. And he is a name familiar to many in agriculture here in this state already. He is from Greensburg. Dennis McKinney is his name. He's Mike's side now. First of all, Dennis, congratulations on the new appointment. Uh, Thank you. Saying that you're familiar to a lot of folk out there, but regardless, let's share a bit about your background, if you would. I farm. We, Our family, we farm there in the southern part of Kiowa County, northern part of Comanche County, down in that area. I served as a county commissioner. I served in the state legislature. I was state treasurer for two years. Probably my most difficult public service job. I've also served as a trustee on our, local, our county hospital board, <laughs> which has been a, a good challenge, but a learning challenge. Try to serve in a variety of public service roles, as well as farming. Talk about your farming enterprise, too. Folks are always interested in that angle. We're fairly typical for southwest Kansas. You know, main crops would be wheat and cattle. We also grow milo, and and we try other crops occasionally. But, you know, wheat and cattle remain the main products in our area, as well as a lot of our a lot of the ground in our area was highly rotable, not highly productive, has been planted back to grass in the last 30 years. And so, uh, you know, the particularly cow-calf operations, have grown in in importance in the economy in our region. Well, as a producer, you have obviously developed a familiarity with the Farm Service Agency as a public servant in those several capacities likewise. So what enticed you to explore and then take on this new directorship? Well, new adventure. sounds like a new adventure in life, new challenge. Of course, FSA has a primary role in in looking out for the the well-being of, of producers, seeing we have a safe, abundant, adequate food supply in the United States, that we practice good conservation, and that we basically serve the public interest by having a safe and abundant food supply. And I've always thought that was a, a good role. I grew up around people. My parents came through the Depression and the Dust Bowl. I had neighbors I grew up around would tell us stories about you know, what it was like in the years when the only wheat you raised was what grew behind the snow fence the county put along the highway. Uh, they saved that wheat, took it to the flour mill in Kinsley, so used it for their own families. But, you know, grew up with a lot of stories like that. Those people also told us what it meant to them when the farm program was created and how the farm program helped to remove risk 
from their farming operations because the farmers suffer both weather risk and price risk. And that's a lot of what we do in the Farm Service Agency. We try to maintain family farmers productively in business so that we have a safe and abundant food supply in the United States and we conserve our resources. So, you know, people like me, the growing up around my parents, all those neighbors, uh, they instilled in us a strong conservation ethic. In Greensburg, we rebuilt after the tornado. We talked about being green, rebuilding as the greenest community. And we had a lot of people that were skeptical. And they said, what does it mean to be green? Well, they explained it to us. It was basically what we'd been taught, you know, so when we were children, take care of the land, land will take care of you. Leave it better than you found it. All those basic uh, principles we were taught from an early age. So there was nothing new when they talked to us about sustainability or being green. So those principles remain intact as far as the mission and purpose of FSA. That's correct. In fact, they're still a, a very important part of what we do at the Farm Service Agency. Well, as you take the reins, you look at the agency here in Kansas, it's had to contend with any number of things because of the pandemic largely in providing that service to producers. Where where do you think the agency stands at this point? We're, we, for a while, we were to only – our offices at the county level, only at 25 percent staffing for a brief time, and, and producers couldn't come into the office. Now we're back up to 75 percent staffing in all but just a few counties, and producers are welcome by appointment. So we're back up and running, we believe, and – we have a lot of things to get done. We have an ARC PLC sign-up deadline coming soon. We still have a lot of farms to get signed up for that, so I remind everybody get out there and get signed up ahead of the deadline. Uh, we have a CRP sign-up deadline coming for a, a CRP enrollment that's going on right now. That's coming up in mid-March. You know, we've got a few, of course, as is common in many businesses, we have a few software glitches going on that we're working on with that and a few other problems we're working on with that. But uh, there is a CRP sign-up going on now as well. Probably my top priority right now is disaster response. That's one of the missions of FSA is disaster response. We had several fires there in December with high straight line winds. Uh, the biggest one was in Ellis and Russell counties. And so our response impacts those counties as well as those surrounding counties, those contiguous counties. We're trying to get producers signed up for assistance to rebuild their fences. That's important for two reasons. One, you got to keep your cattle in. Two, we need to keep, I know from personal experience, we need to keep cattle off those burned areas until that grass is restored itself. So it's important both for conservation, both important for habitat, it's important for future production on those ranches. We also have assistance for farmers who lost quite a big number of their cattle to help them uh, stay in business. You know, in terms, in fact, the Secretary Vilsack has signed a secretarial disaster declaration for that area which is important. It un helps unlock a, a lot of benefits to help those producers recover from that wildfire. On a national level, is that a large disaster? Someone on a national level might say no. If you had to go to town for extra ammunition to euthanize your cows, if you lost your home, it's a big disaster. You bet. I've been on the receiving end of disaster assistance and myself, I know how important it is that we are, we must be effective in, in this response. And part of the equation here is making sure that those eligible producers are aware that this aid is out there. That's we, correct. We presume that, but sometimes that's not the case. Right. We have very dedicated staff in those county offices, and they are helping us to streamline processes so people don't get caught up you know, bureaucratic glitch because you started building your fence, all of a sudden, hey, you're not eligible for assistance. We're doing our best to avoid those kind of situations because we know there's a limited number of contractors. Producers need to get started building fence. First of May is not far off, and they're going to need those fences pretty soon. Administratively speaking, and this has been going on for some years, the magnitude of work that FSA personnel locally have to administer keeps growing. Their numbers don't. So... Right. <laughs> What are your thoughts as far as the infrastructure within FSA? We have uh, oh, around 385 employees in the FSA county offices. That's uh, probably down 30 to 40 percent where it was just a few, you know, maybe 10 to 20 years ago. So we have fewer people delivering more service. We're proud of those people. We're trying to streamline those processes. So we need to make things simple for producers, A, so producers will participate and it's easy to participate in the programs. We also need to make the process as simple so we can handle the workload. And that's an ongoing challenge for us. But our people are getting the work done. But we also want you to hurry up and get signed up for your <laughs> ARC PLC enrollment. So don't wait till the last minute. And those dates specifically are coming up quite soon within the next two or three weeks? Yeah, in the next three weeks, yes. So touch base with your local FSA personnel on ARC PLC on that CRP sign up likewise. Then as we think about 
the farm safety net for producers, the economic safety net. Yet grain prices, we've seen what's happened. They've boomed. Still, the farm programs have a role to play here in keeping that safety net intact. Yeah, that's, and that's what we want to do is help producers manage risk. With the Ukrainian crisis, wheat was up 44 cents today. But if you spend any time at all in agriculture, you know this too shall pass. And we have some periods of very low prices. And that's part of our mission, help keep those family farmers in business so they're there to secure the nation's food supply through time. And that's part of what we want to do. And, you know, in almost 90 years of partnership between our farmers and ranchers and the federal government, we have reduced erosion. We have created the safest, most abundant food supply in the world. And so we think we're pretty successful here, primarily because of those farmers and ranchers across the nation and across Kansas. Want to acknowledge as well that it took a while to fill this position. Want to give a nod here to the gentleman who carried the ball during that time, Chuck Pettijohn, as the acting state director. Hats off to him for making that go. Yes, he's helped me a lot in the transition process as well, so we really appreciate his work. What's your first order of business then as you get going here, Dennis? Well, like I say, the top priority is making sure that we're effective in our disaster response. We have some positions that are open we need to get filled so we can keep delivering services and, and, and evaluate how we do that in the most efficient way going forward. And so that's, you know, where do we put the staff and how, we, how do we manage those staffing challenges so we get services delivered where there's the highest demand? Well, you're familiar with Kansas agriculture, and not only on your own personal level, but certainly as, a, uh, as an individual who served the state well, state treasurer, among other positions. So looking forward to visiting with you and talking about FSA business as we go along here. Dennis, thank you for coming over. Thank you. He's just been announced a few days back as the new state executive director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. Again, a farmer from Kiowa County, the Greensburg area. That's Dennis McKinney. And while we have a few moments here ahead of the break, just to go ahead and fill in the blanks on those deadlines that Dennis was mentioning, that General Conservation Reserve Program sign-up, which has been ongoing since January the 31st, will close two weeks from this Friday on March the 11th. You're all familiar with the workings of that general CRP. Again, March the 11th, the closing date there. The Grassland CRP sign-up will be coming up soon, April the 4th through May the 13th. That, the Grassland CRP, a working lands program. It helps those enrolled protect the grassland while, again, maintaining the areas as working grazing lands. So those are the CRP opportunities ahead. And again, as Dennis mentioned, the Deadline for enrolling in ARC or PLC for this 2022 crop year is Tuesday, March the 15th. Take care of all of that business through your local FSA office. And we will return shortly here on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. With no clouds, it was a full moon. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. With no or few clouds, the moon has been beautiful. We did not get the snow last week, but celebrated winter with a cold, crisp night and a full moon. Walk in the hill with a warm jacket and cap pulled over my ears, the soft moonlight showed the mowed path clearly. In the moonlight, grasses still are showy, even though in a different way than during the day with daylight. What still stands out to me is the early morning when the moon has come down from its overhead loft and it shines through the branches of the trees. The mornings that I leave early, while it is still dark, I take an extra moment to see. It's special. The huge yellow disk of the moon with the tree branches in front of it. The dark cedars with the evergreen branches more open near the top. It makes a special picture. I must see if I can capture it with my pencils and draw it. I will try. 
when I write my daughter in Amsterdam on the back side of the envelope, I try to capture a quick sketch of something which caught my eye. Those quick drawings are not artwork, but with a few lines, I show what I saw. In this case, it's going to be a few lines for the dark cedar tops against the still dark night sky, but all lit up by the low-hanging moon as backdrop. I hold it in my head. Now, can I draw it? My answer to that is, do it and see what comes up. I wonder if painters think that way. I wonder what Van Gogh would have thought. He would have loved the Kansas sunflower. But I'm talking moon here, and I want to celebrate its soft light. I want to hold it in my mind for when I can no more step outside to see the big full moon hanging overhead and slowly as we turn, come down and dip behind the hills. On an evening like we have had, I pity the people who live in cities. A farmer can, once his eyes are adjusted, do the chores by moonlight. Of course, if he needs to use the tractor to lift bales, he will use the headlights, and with the rumbling noise of the tractor, the quiet of the night is gone. But once the tractor is back in the shed and eyes are readjusted to the bright night, take a few steps back to the gate. Lean on that gate and listen to the cow steer the grass out of the bale and chew. I can hear it, not even being there. And I can just see their shiny backs and the glimmers of their dark eyes with moonlight. Just stand there. It's not cold, it's crisp, and the stars stand far away. The moonlight is overpowering and reflects on the barn roof. It's all quiet, but for the sounds the chewing cattle make. This is the moon my younger son got out of bed for and sneaked outside and went to the corral. Then he sat on the railing and talked softly to his ponies, Pop-Tart, Misty and Flesh. When I called out in the dark from the back door, he answered from the small barn, I'm here, talking to the horses. That is living. We need the sun to grow things, but I love the moon. And in Kansas, we can celebrate the moon in all its stages, but the full moon is very special. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Thanks for tuning in. Please be back with us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.